Okay, so this is some import this is kind of some important information. They're talking about tracking Melanie Eames car to Maryland. I want to bring in my guest for this afternoon, Eric Johnson, who joins us by phone. And we have Randy Zellen, criminal defense attorney here in Manhattan, here in studio with us. Randy, I'm gonna take it to you first. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this confession because he's leading up to it now because he ends up traveling to Maryland where they find Melanie Eam. Do you see any problems as a defense attorney of how this confession was got? There, well, let's let's give it some context because there are there are two very important things that go into whether or not a confession is going to be admitted by a judge so the jury can hear from the defendant's own mouth, I did it. So what are those components? Well, like we see on Law & Order, you have the Miranda warnings. Yep. Your right to remain silent, that anything that you say can be used against you, and that you have the right to counsel. Under those circumstances, when someone is in custody, meaning they're not free to leave, and they are being interrogated, meaning they're being asked questions, the answers to which would get them into trouble, you have to be given your rights, your Miranda warnings. But that's only one piece of it. Then you have the voluntariness piece of it. So even a, a confession that is the product of, okay, I'm waiving my rights and I'm gonna tell you that I did it. If that's not voluntary, meaning me as the defendant, my free will, my ability to exercise my free will has been overcome by police misconduct. That confession, if it's not the product of free will, that confession will be tossed out by a judge. So here, what we're really going to be focused in on is whether or not Melanie's confession was the product of her own free will. Was it voluntary or was it involuntary? It, was it coerced? Okay, and very quickly, the judge is allowing this confession to be entered into evidence in this trial. This detective is probably going to talk about it very soon. The fact that the judge said that she wasn't under arrest and therefore, Eric, her, uh, her, her uh, constitutional rights were not violated, um, is there a problem with that, do you see? different level of interactions between the police and citizens. What the judge is saying is that this was not an interrogation where they would require the Miranda warnings, but this was more just a conversation and she had the right to terminate it at any time. If she chose not to do so and then in that conversation incriminated herself, then that type of confession is one where the judge would say that her rights hadn't been violated and it would possibly be considered voluntary. All right. Well, this is very interesting. We have to take a quick break here on Law and Crime. We're inside the Melanie Eam trial out of Florida. We'll take you back inside when we return in just a few minutes. Stay with us. everybody to Law and Crime. We're inside that Melanie Eam trial and it, the lead detective is still on the stand. Uh, he's talking about how he chased Melanie Eam to Maryland where he's going to talk about the confession Melanie Eam allegedly gave him when he spoke with him. Again, this is a bit controversial. She's accused of brutally stabbing her boyfriend. Let's listen into the lead detective in this case. Okay, this is critical. We just heard the detective talk about how Melanie Eam admitted to the stabbing. Randy? Yes. Um, do you think they did a pretty good job of setting up that she wasn't coerced? Oh, absolutely. And they did it in a very calm, cool, and a matter-of-fact way because what the prosecution will argue Again, getting back to what we talked about earlier, when you talk about an involuntary or a coerced confession, has the defendant's free will been taken away as a result of police misconduct? So here, what is the evidence we have of free will? Well, first of all, aside from the fact that they went to her, they asked for permission to come in. That permission could have been denied. She was told that she was not under arrest. Yep. She was given the opportunity to leave and go to the police precinct. So there's a great example of free will. She could go, she could not go, or she could say, leave. Then they set the scene. 
The interview took place at the dining room table with an open floor plan because, on again, what do you typically think of? A little tiny room with one door and detectives sitting by the door so the defendant can't leave. No food, no water, dimly lit, rotting right. stuff. This was a very... I mean, this is as relaxed an atmosphere as you could hope for. And that is exactly why the testimony has come out the way that it has to show. She's not being coerced. Okay, let's listen in because they were just pulling out some bloody clothing. Uh, it looks like the judge is talking. Uh, the attorneys are conferring with each other. Let's listen in. Eric, what do you make of that description by the detective of the confession there? Well, as as they said, I mean, he did a very good job of laying out a claim that there was no coercion or there was no duress or anything else presented to the suspect in this case. I mean, her defense attorney is going to have to come back and try to make, put the jury in her position and say that despite all the things that he said, it was still a coercive added, um, atmosphere and possibly bring up the fact that he didn't advise her that she could get counsel for this conversation or anything else. But it's going to be pretty hard because the detective was very good with laying out um, a very relaxed and calm conversation where she was not coerced in any way. Okay, and right now the judge is giving some instructions about that recording with Melanie Eames. So my assumption is in the next couple of minutes we're going to be hearing the recording ourselves and we can decide for ourselves um, as viewers here, how we think it came off, if she sounded like she was coerced or not into this. Okay, let's listen. I think they're about to play the recording. Let's listen. Lights just went off upstairs. All right, folks, that is part of the recording of Melanie Eam. You can see the detective going up to the house. It's a bit hard to hear, but, of course, this is very important. We have to take a quick break here on Law and Crime. We're going to keep our ear to that recording. And when we come back, we hope to take you back inside that Florida courtroom for the Melanie Eam trial. Stay with us here on Law and Crime. All right, so we're listening to her confession there. That's Melanie Eam. A bit hard, I want to apologize to hear. You can hear the detective pretty well. And then you have Melanie Eam crying. You can hear her wailing. And then you can hear her saying, I didn't mean to. Quickly to you, Eric Johnson, criminal defense attorney, what you've heard so far, pretty damning for the, the defense. Thing. 
and that it was most likely pretty bad. So, I mean, I think that the defense in this case probably needed to adjust their strategy from the some other guy did it. Uh, uh, you don't think, Randy's on, you don't think this is a murder two case? No, I, I don't think that it's a murder two case, but unfortunately for the defense, as Eric just said, the defense of I didn't do it may turn this case into a murder two because if the jurors are left with murder two or I got to walk her out of the courtroom, they ain't walking her out of the courtroom now. Could they or could the defense smarten up and say, you know what, maybe we should not go for it all and let's ask for what we would call the lesser included offense of manslaughter. But as I sit here, is this a murder two case? No, it's not. Yeah, I understand that there was a knife involved, which technically may make it murder two. But in reality, you have a young woman, no prior criminal record. Clearly, she did get set off. Her boyfriend just broke up with her. It's not like she drove there with the knife. The bad news is she drove there, but she didn't drive there with the knife. It would appear as if she snapped, heat of passion, a moment of rage, grabs the knife, starts stabbing, freaks out, and leaves. So That's you think this is two. a manslaughter case, not a murder or two, and that the premeditation element is missing. Let's continue. I think we still have... Oh, okay. We are, if you want to continue watching the Melanie Eam trial here on Long Prime, we have it live on our site. Uh, right now, it's a critical part of the case. They're playing the confession where she admits to the whole thing, says she didn't mean to. But we have another big case that we're covering, so we now have to take you to California, where we are back live in the McStay family murders case. Um, this is the guy that is accused of killing, Charles Merritt is the defendant's name, accused of killing an entire family, including a three- and a four-year-old. Um, they were reported missing back in 2010. Their bodies were not discovered until 2013, found in a shallow grave. Um, according to the medical examiner, the family was bludgeoned to death, and the police believe that Charles Merritt, Joseph McStay, who you see pictured right there um, on the right-hand side of the screen, his business partner, they believe, is to blame for all of this. That's him, Charles Merritt. He says that the prosecution has the wrong guy and that they botched this entire investigation. It looks like we're back, okay, we're back live in the case, uh, but it doesn't look like a whole lot is going on. So I'm going to talk to Randy really quickly about this. Unlike the Melanie Eam case, it sure seems like Charles Merritt has some legs to run with here. Well, I think that all depends on perspective and it all depends on the evidence because you certainly are going to have evidence of a financial motive for Mr. Merritt to have been the killer. There apparently is going to be cell phone evidence, technology, and the advances in technology have apparently allowed the prosecution to place his cell phone at or about the grave site. So you have motive, then the fact that things apparently were not going well in the business, and because they were business partners, you have opportunity. You have technological evidence placing him at the grave area where mm -hmm. there would be no other reason. And his behavior after the fact, the fact that apparently there's going to be evidence of him making withdrawals, mm -hmm. that's all bad news. The good news is there's not really any physical evidence. Apparently, there may be some issue of whether or not... Well, there was DNA on the car. Exactly. Um, but the defense is trying to say here, well, yeah, of course there was DNA on the car because uh, he was a business associate and had been in the car prior to this happening. Right. doesn't mean he is the murderer. Okay. It looks like we have Mike McStay on the stand. He is the brother of the victim, Joseph McStay. It looks like they're looking at some kind of PowerPoint. He's been on the stand for quite some time. Let's listen to see where they're going with all of this. Okay, well, Mike McStay is reviewing some of the documents there. I want to bring in Randy Zellin. Where do we think we're going? I asked this of Eric Johnson, but sometimes the prosecution takes a while to get to their point. Where do you think we're going with this witness so far? I would again agree with Eric. It would seem to me that they are trying to establish behavior on the part of the defendant that would be inconsistent with 
his innocence mm -hmm. and that things that he might have done, things that he might have said, whether it was throwing people off the trail or saying things that weren't true or behaving in a way that just now when you put the, you have the puzzle and you're putting it together and you look, wait a minute, that piece, according to the defendant, that doesn't fit. That is my sense of it. But to your earlier point, you would like to think this is a quadruple homicide case. Yes. This is a death penalty case. Get to it. The, as prosecutors and as human beings, I think we're all guilty of insecurity, where we want to do everything, dot every I, cross every T. And oftentimes what we end up doing is diluting I the strength of our case. This case is expected. It could last, I, I kid you not, anywhere from four to eight months. And I'm sorry, any jury after eight months, no matter how good your evidence is, they're going to start getting lost in the weeds there, especially if it's, uh, you know, meticulously going thing, through things that aren't necessarily important. Okay, looks like we have more testimony from Mike McStay, who's on the stand. Let's listen. Okay, so we have Mike McStay, who is on the stand right now. He's the brother of the victim. He's talking about going back to the victim's home. And this is where the prosecutors believe the murders happened in this home. And he's talking about how he was with Charles Merritt. Uh, and he, he went inside the home, but Charles Merritt wouldn't help him go inside. There was a broken window in the back, had been broken. And Michael went to crawl through that and Merritt wouldn't help him at all. However, it's interesting to note that Merritt said there were no signs of foul play inside the home. And this was 11 days after the disappearance of this family of four. Uh, do you think this helps the prosecution at all? It's so difficult to tell. I, I, I sit here and I, I, I try to read the tea leaves, and it may be because it's a death penalty case and they're trying to really humanize and soften up the jury, put the brother on, have the brother get emotional after having right. the mom on and start creating some real aggravating factors. Eric Johnson, the fact that Merritt, Charles Merritt, the defendant, wouldn't go in the house very quickly, is that a sign of guilt? Is that remarkable in any way? I mean, not at all. I mean, he's going in with the brother. I mean, that doesn't mean that he killed anybody. And the fact that there was no signs of foul play, I mean, means that there was nothing in there for him to be scared to see because there were no signs of foul play found by the authorities. So the trying to focus in on him not going into the house is something that they're reaching for straws and shows some of the weaknesses in the state's case. And again, the prosecutor believes the murders happened in that house, but the defense is really making the point there's very little evidence that could be the case. we got to take a quick break. I'm signing off. We'll be back in a minute.